What forces shape where we end up in life? How do our paths reflect or not reflect our wills? In the words of today's featured artist, it is the messy convergences and rhymes of our lives that inspire him, and he examines them using the tools of new media. By reimagining what art can be, he uses video, computers, and the internet, along with more traditional media, to give us a wider perception of who and what we are. On this edition of Art Now, we'll look at the work of Kevin Hamilton. Hi, welcome to Art Now, a program where we talk to artists whose work is part of our community. I'm Pat Salmon, and I'll be your host. Our guest today is Kevin Hamilton, Assistant Professor in New Media and Painting at the University of Illinois School of Art and Design. He has a BFA in Painting from the Rhode Island School of Design and a Master's from the Visual Arts Program at MIT. Much of his work is rooted in academic research. He holds appointments with both the Department of Media and Cinema Studies and the Center for Arms Control, Disarmament, and International Security. And he is also the co-director of the Center for People and Infrastructures at the Coordinated Science Laboratory. His focus is on how technology affects our interactions, and he has created interdisciplinary courses for students in the sciences and arts and humanities. His work in new media has been part of exhibitions in the Midwest, Boston, San Francisco, LA, and Europe, as well as in online exhibitions. He has earned residencies at the Banff New Media Institute and the Integrated Media Lab at the University of Southern California, and his grants have included awards from the Illinois Arts Council, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the National Science Foundation. Kevin, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. Let's start by having you explain by what is meant by new media. Well, artists that work in new media typically want to take either tools that are available to a lot of people through consumer electronics or mm -hmm. tools that are fresh out of research settings in the sciences and try to see what their potentials are for okay. personal expression or exploration of their the way they change our senses. Okay. Uh, today we're meeting in the Urbana Free, Libra uh, Free Library Archives and much of your work stems from academic research uh, that draws on archival systems. Uh, what caused you to move in that direction seeing as you started with painting? Yeah, I, I really am someone who came out of a tradition of loving to be alone in the studio mm. and just pushing the paint around, and I still do. But I found after a while that art could accommodate my other curiosities, which are the kind of almost detective processes mm. of getting into a, pro a stack of books or papers like the ones behind us, opening things no, maybe nobody's touched for years and years, and finding stories in there about how we got the world we have today. Great. Uh, many of your projects are long-term and they're done in collaboration with others. Uh, how do those develop? How do you get started? They usually start from conversations with people where somebody finds something in their own research that they don't feel like they have all the tools to analyze or answer questions about and so mm -hmm. they bring it out and they say, hey, what do you think of this and mm -hmm. how might you approach this? And so mm -hmm. we end up taking some problem that seems like it doesn't really belong fully in either of our worlds and work on it together. Okay. Yeah, a lot of you think things you do are interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, this first one we're going to look at is a project called Department of Rhythm Analysis. And this 2005 project uh, used industrial interfaces like colored lights and switches to represent actual events taking place that could take place. Uh, the idea of rhythm analysis is that seeing an accumulation of these responses of all these interfaces might well describe a place or a time. Uh, kind of gives the viewer a method of perceiving simultaneous stimuli. I think you compared it to hearing multiple sounds mm -hmm. all at once as opposed to seeing and focusing on one thing at a time. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how this particular project worked. Yep, and this, this was one of the last projects I did that was you know, really made for and belonged in an art gallery. Mm -hmm. um, and I still love to go to art galleries, but this was one of the last times my work really was in there. And uh, this work really uh, grew out of my fascination with the backgrounds of uh, Cold War era science fiction movies. There's always a bunch of blinky lights behind people in those yep. movies, right? <laughs> and they meant, they're meant to signify some kind of activity. 
uh, and we're never right. quite sure what, right? Right. And I started to think about that even in terms of our own interfaces on our screens and how sometimes the smallest change, the going, you know, a, a green light turning to a red light or font all of a sudden becoming bold or a little ding, all of a sudden makes us think something's happened. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to sort of look at how that how that works in terms of our perception. How, how mm -hmm. do we are, attach reality to that? Mm -hmm. So what the Department of Rhythm Analysis was, was a, a network of very, very simple indicator lights. So mm -hmm. uh, a grid of boxes, each box claiming to monitor one condition mm -hmm. as some sort of binary logic situation where something was either happening or not happening. So right. each box had a red light and a green light. Um, they would blink uh, mysteriously, mm -hmm. uh, not always clear why they were changing, but because they were labeled as if something really was happening, like one box, it would blink when there was a bird singing or not. Well, there weren't mm -hmm. any birds in the gallery, right. so, but the, the sort of gist of it was uh, it would cause a viewer to imagine, well, is it hooked up to something somewhere out there? Is there mm -hmm. a bird singing? And then I actually had a timer circuit in there that would make it blink at the rhythm of a bird um, oh, yeah. uh, in terms of song. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, some of the boxes were actually hooked up to things the viewers and users could uh, operate. They could ah. switch something. Mm -hmm. Or there, was a, there were a few sensors in the room that would change things. Okay. And so it was all meant to introduce some doubt and imagination about what was really instrumented and what wasn't in, ah, in the okay. space. So were people aware of the sensors, though, or did they...? I think so. I mean, okay. the, certainly the switches that, you know, they really ask you to turn, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it made a big click, and when you turned it, a lot of different things would change, and then you'd have to go and trace, oh, I, some rhythms change, let me go see what my, ah, what's yeah. different, or one of the sensors was on the door of the gallery, so you could really see yeah. and test that. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Okay, uh, this next uh, project we're going to look at is Cybernetics on the Prairie. Uh, this was a commission uh, public artwork and it has three parts, a mural, a uh, reprinted collection of historic texts, and a recreated historical computer. Uh, it's meant to commemorate the early years of work on cybernetics done at the U of I uh, that have largely been forgotten today. Uh, it also considers the nature of institutional memory and the challenges of working in a modern university. Um, you want to say a little bit, though, first about what cybernetics is? Sure. <laughs> and you know, cybernetics has a lot of different definitions for a lot of different people, and even mm -hmm. for some people here in our own town, it's a very important topic to them who may have their own definitions that right. will differ from my own. But right. the way I would describe cybernetics, as I understand it in the history of science, is that um, it's a, a way of trying to approach description of the world in terms of systems. Right. The idea that you could look at an ob something in nature, mm -hmm. something in human society, something about our own communication, mm -hmm. uh, and analyze it as some kind of a system of input and output signals that even may produce some kind of feedback loop at some point. Right. Okay. Uh, what we're looking at here is the mural, which you did in collaboration with Miriam Moore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's permanently installed at the Institute for Genomic Biology on campus. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more now about how that was created? Yep, so this was really one of my first projects where I really let myself disappear into the archives for a while, in this case the university archives, mm -hmm. because after I'd been here a couple of years, because yeah. I was in new media, I started learning more about cybernetics because a lot of artists were influenced by that mm -hmm. mode of thought. Yeah. And when I finally discovered that one of the centers of cybernetics was on my own campus where mm -hmm. I worked, I'm, I was really knocked off my chair. I had yeah. no idea. So yeah. I really jumped at the idea of creating a public artwork on my own campus that explored that history. Yeah. So this was uh, a project where I really tried to, to go back and figure out who was there, when were they there, what mm -hmm. was their actual outcome, mm -hmm. uh, what was left behind. And Miriam mm -hmm. and I um, kicked around some different ideas and uh, I, ha I had a timeline in mind from the beginning for how this might work. Okay. And then we've got uh, more pictures of it here. It's yeah. pretty lengthy. Yeah, the, the basic ingredients of this are that there's a, there's a, a one set of, of elements on the timeline that tell the the sort of lifespans of really influential cybernetics researchers. Mm -hmm. There's another set, the blue stripes on the wall, mm -hmm. are the histories of genetics and genomics, which are mm -hmm. the actual mm -hmm. building that houses this mural. Right. And then there's another set of just world events. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can kind of see them in parallel and see how the sort of rise and fall of different uh, approaches to genetics, to cybernetics, and, and what else was happening. Sometimes yeah. really monumental things like the span of World War II you can see on there, but mm -hmm. also really seemingly small things like when squirrels were introduced to campus. 
Um, I really tried to get a, a juxtaposition <laughs> I love that. of things. And again, yeah. the simultaneity is really an interest of mine, helping mm -hmm. us get think about all the things that were happening at once. Right, very good. Uh, and here, here's kind of a close-up of that. Yeah, and so you can see here some of the details of these, the names of some of these scientists. Um, I also included drawings of many of the animals and species that played a big part in these histories. Mm -hmm. And then the, across the middle of the wall, the sort of black stripe, are the front pages of the most significant publications in both of these histories. Ah, okay. And because one thing that I was really struck by looking at this history is that there's no monument to cybernetics anywhere. There's not a big no. cement uh, or granite statue. Yeah. Not, neither is really one to, to genetics, but there are a lot of papers. <laughs> There's a lot of books. I'm sure, and, yes. and, and, and paper, in some ways, is the most important material of science. Yeah. Because in the end, you've got to publish it for someone else to read it and build their knowledge on yours. Right. So actually, the fun part of this was that for some of these documents, even the ones back to three or 400 years ago, mm -hmm. I could just go right over to the Rare Books Collection across the quad from the Genomics right. Building yeah. and find those old documents and get scans of the front pages for this yeah. mural. So, oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Great. Okay, I think the next uh, one shows the collection of reprinted texts, and how were those uh, originally used at the lab? I think you so, had something interesting to say yeah. about that. So the, one of the things that I, I see as the, and the name of the lab that was here on, on, on campus was the Biological Computer Laboratory, mm -hmm. and that was the cybernetics lab, and mm -hmm. they were very known for these pamphlets, and every time mm -hmm. anybody in the lab would publish a paper, or deliver mm -hmm. a talk, mm -hmm. or even if a class would end at the end of a semester, they'd produce a booklet. Yeah. And I see these as the web pages of their days. Yeah, right? because yeah, that's a good these, point. These became ways of transferring and making public some aspect of the knowledge. And I'm told right. that if you were new to the cybernetics lab, and you came and said, I'm interested, they'd hand you a stack of these things and say, go read these and come back. Yeah. Right? And so I found these in our university archives mm -hmm. and uh, found evidence that they had circulated in the world. Um, mm -hmm. There was a very influential publication in the 70s and 60s called the Whole Earth Catalog. And yeah. I found an order form for, for these booklets in sure. that uh, catalog. So people right. were looking at these all around. Yeah. And so I... Uh, uh, scanned them all and reproduced them as closely as I could to the original and then installed them here for people to, to read there in the genomics building. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I also was going to ask whether the computer re recreation had been done yet. It is functional at this point. So ah. uh, Scott Weedman uh, has been working with me on that. Scott was an MFA student at the time when mm -hmm. I started it. He's now uh, working for the electrical engineering department here. Ah, okay. And um, it's been a really great process of really trying to take science at its word in terms of the repeatability of experiments mm -hmm. and uh, working backwards from Murray Babcock's PhD thesis where he wow. <laughs> talked about a machine that learned, mm -hmm. you know, pre-programming era, right. Right? right? And so Scott and I wanted to see, well, what do they mean by learning? Let's recreate this thing. Let's yeah. reenact it. Yeah. And it's working, all, you know, in sort of desk form. You know, you, if you lay it all out there, at, and you and you start it, you can tell it's. We think it. We think we understand what it's doing. We think it. <laughs> we think it does what they said it does. <laughs> and based on that, we've been able to publish some papers actually to, uh, to kind of help illuminate that history. Great. Yeah. Very good. Okay, we're going to look at a different project now. This is American Sinai, mm -hmm. and this is more of a personal project for you, I, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Uh, you've described this project as an investigation of how you came to associate the Rocky Mountains in Colorado with the divine, mm -hmm. and how that fits into the larger narrative of white con conquest of the West and Christian pilgrimage. Yeah. Uh, it centers on the Mount of the Holy Cross, which has a distinctive cross-shaped snowfield. And you visit the site in a guise of a seemingly unrelated 60s underground cartoon character, yeah. Zippy. Yeah. Tell us some more about this. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, there's different areas of my life coming together in one here. Again, mm -hmm. um, uh, we used to visit Colorado in the summers and go camping. I grew up in South Carolina. My family yeah. would go camping out there for a couple of weeks, and it became a really important place and for me. And I remember my parents pointing out the Mount of the Holy Cross to me when I was mm -hmm. young, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and you know, them pointing it to me as a sort of confirmation that you know we really are in this place that was created by God and that is pristine in this way, and that therefore yeah. we feel closer to God when we're up here. And, gotcha. And um, and I I related to that, you know, I felt yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of us visit these places. Uh, well, they really are kind of awe-inspiring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we feel yeah. we feel like our heads and our hearts are in different places, right? Yeah. And um, I think as I grew older, 
certainly that didn't go away, but I also started to learn more about mm. the role of those mountains and the, the site that those mountains served as a place of conquest and as, you know, mm. a, a, place of, a place where uh, indigenous peoples were removed, often in order to make room for right. us settlers to f feel like we were having a divine experience. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah. There's a there was a history I was interested in kind of exploring because I mm -hmm. I, I once want to acknowledge that and my dependence on that and also uh, acknowledge the continuing reality of my association of that space with the divine. Right. Okay. So we've got a, I think a few pictures. Yeah. So how Zippy comes in is that Zippy the pinhead became my kind of mode mode of investigating this with my own body and not mm -hmm. just in the archives again. Mm -hmm. um, so the connection here is that the most famous and influential photograph of Mount of the Holy Cross, the one that drew all the tourists in mm -hmm. the early, early 20th century, late 19th mm -hmm. century, uh, was made by a very famous photographer named William Henry Jackson. He was mm -hmm. formerly a Civil War photographer, and then he accompanied the land surveys out across those Rockies. Right. Well, it, it's his great-grandson, Bill Griffith, is the cartoonist of Zippy the Pinhead. Right. So, so since I was connection. exploring these kind of familial roots, yeah. I thought it might make sense to do to sort of use some familial connections here and yeah. again go back to this interest of mine in juxtaposition and right. sort of simultaneity getting different worlds collided. So right. yeah, I, I hiked up to, to get a good look at the Hope Mount of the Holy Cross um, mm -hmm. as, as Zippy to sort of re restore and, and reconnect and loop that. That's that great. I think we have a couple more pictures here. And um, I've done this project a few different ways. There are these photographs but I also have a, a performance I, I do mm -hmm. that um, in many ways uh, is inspired by my interest in in the monologue as, mm -hmm. as a form and in okay. creative nonfiction, the yeah. kind of work my, my good friend Deke Weaver does. And yeah. so I, I have uh, about a 30 minute performance where I, I narrate my own life and my own relationship to these stories and try to weave them together. Okay, uh, I think, oh, I, I, we do have a picture of the mural as well that you did. That's right, yes. Right yeah. there. Yeah, and this still hasn't found a home. This is one I'm uh, I really would like it to live in Colorado somewhere, mm -hmm. and um, it's a mural that really tries to get all the information I found in one place in terms of some of the most key zippy strips mm -hmm. that tell the connection, yeah. some of the key images from the Old West surveys, and then some a kind of collage of my own uh, search for the mountain uh, as zippy. Right, yeah, and there's a lot of interesting information there, too, just about yeah. what's happened all during that timeline. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, now, you did this mural. Are you also going to be doing a book? I, know I really would like to. Um, you know, very, I feel like this does merit a book that mm -hmm. would sort of merge the comic form, mm -hmm. which is still an interest of mine, and mm -hmm. the text form. And yeah. um, I like the idea that you can go you know, change from one chapter to the next and jump around in history a lot. You know, yeah. The linear form of the book could really support this yeah. project. Yeah. Okay, this next project is the film and, film and the citizen-state interface in the nuclear age. Uh, this is a collaboration you've done uh, that looks at how American citizens' attitudes about America as becoming a global nuclear power changed after World War II and were shaped by film. Uh, it includes putting together a book on the figure of the console operator and the construction of a nuclear state, bringing together a collection of nuclear-related government films and contextualizing them, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and creating an account of the activities of the 1352nd Motion Picture Squadron of the Air Force, which for 20 years after the war produced these films. Uh, the way that you and your collaborator, Ned O'Gorman, are creating the Nuclear Film Archive is pretty innovative. Why don't you tell us more about that? Sure. So this is the project I'm up to my ears in these days and have been for okay. about four or five years now. Okay. And you know, we're working on this little known Air Force run film studio that was based in Hollywood that mm -hmm. produced hundreds and hundreds of films, wow. largely meant only for internal use in the government about mm -hmm. nuclear bombs and, and weaponry. Yeah. And so we wanted to start returning these films uh, not only into the public view, but into the public view in a way that un where they can be understood as a group, as a corpus, because many of mm -hmm. these aren't even identified as mm -hmm. being made by this one unit. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to put them in one place online mm -hmm. and allow people to view them and then as they're viewing them, almost like a director's commentary on a DVD, mm, okay. yeah. uh, uh, objects will come up on the screen 
that will either be commentary we've written about some of the what you're seeing mm -hmm. or other government documents that help enlighten some of what you're seeing mm -hmm. or connections to other web pages out there online that might help you understand what's mm -hmm. in the film yeah and then uh, connection to that we have different visualizations that sort of show you uh, okay. some of the structures of the films okay great yeah um, the last one we're going to look at right now is a project that's kind of uh, very relevant to our, our viewers because this has got to do with an event that happened in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, it's a short graphic novel you did uh, that was created as a public artwork for free distribution in Champaign-Urbana. It was funded through a grant from the Urbana Public Arts Commission uh, and this is a novel focusing, a graphic novel focusing on a televised discussion about campus unrest in 1968 that brought together two local personalities in a one-time event. John Lee Johnson, who was a civil rights activist, and Heinz von Forster, a university professor and one of, the, one of the founders of cybernetics. It reflects on all the history that came before the event and followed it. Uh, what drew you to examine that particular event? So this grew out of the earlier project we were discussing, the mural about cybernetics there mm, in the Genomics mm -hmm. Building. Yeah. And while I was doing that research, I came across a transcript of this television broadcast. And it was so interesting to me that Heinz von Forrester had kept this and heavily underlined pieces of it. Wow. And also, I, just, I was just curious about how did this happen? This national television broadcast yeah. happened about, about race in our own town. Yeah. So I kind of filed that away. And once I got farther uh, through with the cybernetics mural, I wanted to come back to this yeah. and really wanted to understand what happened. And uh, initially, I thought, well, let's track down this actual television broadcast and mm -hmm. see if we could get it out for people to see. Yeah. And though I did find it, it's somewhat mired in intellectual property problems and they're oh, not real crazy yeah. about the idea of it being screened again for, mm -hmm. for reasons that are frankly uh, wrong. But well, we, we had to work with the lawyers, lawyers on that one. Right. And right. so I thought maybe this might be a good way to translate it mm -hmm. into yeah. a, a, a drawn form. Right. Yeah. And I'm also curious about how you decided what parts of history you were going to include in yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So again, this draws from some of my interests that we talked about of of deep time, of timelines, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. simultaneity, mm -hmm. and I wanted to really look at this event, this this uh, this one night's TV broadcast, as a, a kind of crossing of paths, mm -hmm. you know, sort of very uh, fortuitous and and almost random uh, collision of different things in one place. What yeah. all what all does it take for for you and I to meet at this place right now? Right? Yeah. Th that kind of question yeah. is what drew me to the structure of the yeah. book and the stories. Yeah. Great. Okay, uh, I guess the last thing I would ask is just if there are any other current projects that you're working on you'd like to talk about. Well, I think, again, my, my time mostly these days is in the, the nuclear film work and, um, and also I think where that's starting to come back around to my interest in books is that mm. uh, though my collaborator Ned and I have published scholarly articles, we really started to see over time that the work comes most alive when we, when we perform it almost, mm. right? When we're really at a scholarly conference and we're not just reading, mm -hmm. but we've got a really tightly timed multimedia presentation yeah. that really gets people uh, overwhelmed and, and immersed in this stuff. And so yeah. I'm now designing a, a book uh, that will work both in the scholarly realm and in the popular realm oh, great. Uh, that really tries to get all these images uh, from this Cold War uh, unit uh, into one place that's really stimulating for the reader. That's great. So, well, yeah. keep us informed. I'd like to see yeah, that. Yeah, we'll do. Okay. Well, thanks very much for being with us today. Yeah. Thank Our guest you. To sure. Our guest today has been Kevin Hamilton. You can see more of Kevin's work at his website at httpcomplexfields.org. We hope you've enjoyed today's show, and we also hope it will inspire you to explore the local art scene and to make your own art now.